it looks like we're ready to get started. So I'm going to hand it over to Charlotte Reed to begin. All right, thank you, Jessica. All right, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Charlotte Reed. I'm an ecologist with the Forest Service at the Fire Sciences Lab in Missoula. I'll be your moderator today. I want to welcome you all to this afternoon's session on fire regimes. Looks like we have a great set of talks lined up. And even though we only have four talks in this session, it looks like we've managed to cover a really broad geographical area in terms of the systems covered in these talks. So since we are on a tight schedule, we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, first up, we have Emma McClure, who is a graduate student at Western Colorado University. Emma, take it away. My name's Emma. I'm calling from Paso Robles, um, California, the ancestral homelands of the Salinan peoples. I'm in my second year of my MS Ecology degree at Western Colorado University, which I began after working eight years in plant and fire ecology across public lands in the West. Um, this work experience brought me to many awesome places, such as Western Montana for the Liberty Fire in 2017, where this photo was taken. I'm excited to get back in the field upon finishing my degree in May, but for now, thrilled to talk with you all about my thesis research, quantifying fire regime divergence at tree ring fire history sites in the southwestern United States. But first, I want to shout out my amazing project partners and master's thesis committee, Drs. Coop and Armstrong here at Western, Sean Parks with the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute, Alice Margolis with the USGS, and Chris Gitterman out of the Tree Ring Lab at U of A. So while wildfire activity has been on the rise across the Western United States, these trends are more dramatic in the Southwest, both in terms of area burned and proportion of that area burned in high severity. Part of what led to our research is a debate regarding the extent of moderate and high severity fire in these forest types dominated by species such as ponderosa pine and Douglas fir. One hypothesis by Williams and Baker holds that patches of higher severity fire occurred historically in a similar manner to what we see today, while a more widespread hypothesis put forth by Fulay et al. and others emphasizes the unprecedented prevalence of high severity fire in recent decades, due largely to a century of fire suppression and increasing effects of anthropogenic climate change. From the tree ring record, we know that trees survive centuries of frequent low severity fire, burning as often as every three to 10 years in these systems. But a better understanding of how those same sites are burning now could tell us something about the extent to which modern patterns differ from historical norms. With that brief introduction in mind, the overarching question our study aims to address is to what extent do the frequency and severity of modern fires diverge from those of historical fires in the study area? As we'll discuss in more detail soon, the primary strategy we employed to answer this question was intersecting satellite derived burn severity for all modern fires with the fire scar tree site locations. To illustrate the data sources we utilized for this project, here's a fire history plot for one of the North American fire scar tree network sites, Chris Basin's Capitol Peak campground site in the Spola National Forest in New Mexico. So the site burned in the Trigo Fire of 2008 for which the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity Program, or MTBS, produced this grid of severity values utilizing Landsat imagery. And then here you can see where in the fire perimeter the site is located. So the North American Fire Scar Tree Network, which you'll also see referenced in this presentation as NAFSN, is a database which brings together dendroecology data from Canada, the US, and Mexico from a ton of different researchers for easier data accessibility for studies such as ours. Um, if you haven't done so yet, check out Alice Margolis's talk on the network in the on-demand oral presentation videos at the Congress. So using a methodology similar to that of MTBS, we generated satellite-derived burn severity data in Google Earth Engine for all fires over 10 acres, which burned since the inception of the Landsat program in 1984. So I'll refer to the modern era a lot throughout this presentation, by which I mean that period starting in 1984 going through 2020. We supplemented the perimeter data available from MTBS with perimeters from the National Interagency Fire Center, as well as some local fire, fire atlases for some of the national parks and national forests. I will talk shortly about how we also integrated data from the Forest Services Forest Inventory and Analysis Program, or FIA, and our own field work this past summer. 
So although the National Fire Scar Tree Network spans the whole continent, from this study, we decided to home in on Arizona, New Mexico, where there are exactly 600 sites. The orange spotches on this map show as complete a fire history as we could assemble while the dots show burned and unburned in the modern era fire history sites. So I know it's a bit tough to see, but approximately half of those sites have burned since 1984 in a total of 102 fires. This fire history includes a mix of prescribed burns, fully suppressed wildfires, and that elusive category variously referred to over the years as wildland fire use, resource objective, or just simply managed fires. Um, for the brief field season associated with this project, we focused on six areas of particular site density and recent fire, rich recent fire history that are listed on this slide. So in terms of field work, in the interest of seeing how these fire history sites look after recent fire, we returned to a subset of them in those six areas I mentioned to see if we could find the sample trees themselves, as well as to assess stand structure and severity more generally. We measured the overstory sapling and seedling trees and qualitatively measured severity of the most recent fire at each site using a modified composite burn index protocol or CBI. So for those who don't know, CBI is a field protocol typically done one year post fire, which assigns a rating of zero for unburned or no effect to three for highest effect to ecological strata ranging from soil to herbaceous plants to overstory trees, and then averages those ratings. Because some of the sites burned most recently 10 or more years prior to our measurements, we only looked at the fire's effects on trees and thousand hour time lag fuel moisture fuels. Here are a few sample trees we found. The top photo is a stump um, in the Rincons where just kind of at first glance, naked eye, we counted 13 scars. And the bottom photo shows a sampled and still live tree in the Jemez Mountains. I touched on the preliminary steps of our analysis, but to elaborate, we calculated an array of fire history characteristics for each site, including mean, median, and Weibel median fire turn intervals. We then intersected satellite derived burn severity for all modern fires at all sites. We chose to use modeled CBI as our burn severity metric rather than the more traditional uh, metrics derived from normalized burn ratio due to the comparability across fires, sites, and years inherent in the standardized scale of zero to three. We then modeled the relationships between severity of the first modern fire at each site and a bunch of potential, potential predictor variables, including the aforementioned fire regime metrics, climate factors, and our field measured tree mortality in CBI. We also included a simple count of recent fires, which generally fell between the fire scar and satellite records, so like 1900 to 1984. In terms of findings, this plot shows 10 year moving average of fires per year over the past three centuries. Gray lines represent individual North American fire scar tree network sites. Red is a best fit line averaging them all. Increasing frequency in the 18th century is likely a result of leaner data availability in earlier years, but otherwise you can see a pretty steady rate between about 1740 and 1880 of just under 0.1 fires per year, which translates to sites burning once per decade or decade and a half on average. So this rate steeply dropped to nearly nothing by the 1920s and is starting to pick back up in the past few decades, but has a lot of ground to cover to return to that historical mean fire return interval 10 to 15 years from what we found. Um, and even for those sites which have returned to historical levels of fire frequency, we wanted to, to understand how to, the severity of those fires compare. Clearly, we don't have satellite data from the 1700s. So how can we estimate the severity of those historical fires? So we know that for a tree to record a fire with an observable scar, it must survive the fire. Thus, we can roughly, very roughly, divide all the fire effects into severity categories of lethal and non-lethal fires. A colleague of mine at Western, Ashley Woolman, did just that by generating this logistic regression model of tree mortality versus satellite-derived burn severity using FIA plots intersected with subsequent burn severity data. So Woolman et al. thus estimated that 
at a modeled CVI threshold of 1.71, probability of mortality in all overstored trees exceeds 50%. So we applied this threshold to our own study to assess how many sites burned at anomalously high severity levels as compared to their historical fire record. For our purposes then, we pretty much assume that if we could calculate their satellite derived burn severity, any fires recorded in the tree ring record would be below 1.71 CBI at that site, at that tree. So as I mentioned, we had 600 sites in our study area in the fire scar tree network. 53% of those burned between 1984 and 2020, and 52% of those sites which burned experienced two or more fires. Applying this 1.71 CBI threshold to our sites, we found that 40% burned at tree killing severity levels in their first modern fire, demonstrating that fires are now burning at significantly higher severity in sites which, where trees survived frequent fire for centuries. And what does this look like on the ground? So 10 years after the Horseshoe 2 on the left and the Lost Conscious fires, the satellite derived modeled CBI from one year post fire uh, gave us very low and very high severity values here, which jives with what we observed in the field. Almost no tree mortality on the left and 100% on the right. As for historical factors, the mean fire return intervals at these sites were similar. 11.4 at Upper Mormon Canyon in the Chiricahuas and 8.7 at Cerro Brigo in the Jemez. The site's most recent fires prior to 2011 were in 1894 and 1960, respectively. This anecdotally supports our finding, which I'll get to shortly, that historical fire regime characteristics did not significantly influence modern fire severity. Next, we compared field measured tree mortality to both satellite derived shown in purple and field assessed burn severity. Note that the burn severity curves cross the model lethal severity threshold of 1.71 at about 40% tree mortality for field CBI and 80% for satellite. This is a wide range, I'm, I'm guessing probably in part due to um, the modified CBI protocol we used 10 years post fire. But at any rate, um, focusing on the results of the satellite severity, this suggests that the threshold woman at all generated is conservative. We might even see 50% mortality at severity is as low as 1.3. So in our pursuit of explanatory variables for the severity of modern fires, as mentioned, we built models with many potential factors. I was surprised to find that no fire history characteristics like mean fire return interval or even length of time between last historical and first modern fire had a significant impact on severity. Those predictor variables which were significant include evapotranspiration, climate water deficit, vapor pressure deficit, precipitation, and occurrence of recent fires prior to 1984. I mentioned that of the 318 fire scar sites which burned in the modern era, half of those burned more than once. Again, compared with 40% of sites burning at lethal severity in their first modern fire, we saw 28 and 0% of sites doing so in second, third entry fires, respectively. This finding underscores the importance of restoring frequent fire in these systems as a means of decreasing severity in, of subsequent fires. In short, compared with norms from between about 1700 and 1900, we found that fires are generally burning less often and hotter. Only climate and recent fire history were significant predictors of burn severity, although we thus far chose not to incorporate fuel moisture topographic or management strategy variables directly in those models. Half of the sites we analyzed in the study have yet to burn in the modern era, suggesting that we can direct the course of future fire conditions in those sites when they do burn. Finally, because contemporary fire patterns are so far departed from historical regimes and increasing fire frequency and severity is expected to continue in the coming decades, we have ample opportunity to influence severity and thereby minimize tree mortality and other undesired effects. Again, this is especially true given that historical characteristics like mean fire return interval don't seem to influence severity. Therefore, as we have learned from scientific and anecdotal evidence alike, conducting prescribed burns and managing natural starts as shown in this photo of the 2018 Lions Fire in California can go a long way toward preventing high severity fire. I want to again thank my co-authors, 
to the Forest Service for making this research possible, to all the researchers who contributed their decades of fire history data to the North American Fire Scar Tree Network, and to our agency collaborators who facilitated research permits and provided additional local fire data. Had an awesome field crew this summer and truly have an exceptional group of colleagues at Western Colorado University. A few of my many, many works cited for this project and I should have five minutes to answer any questions you might have, but if we run out of time or want to chat more, please email me. Thanks again for coming. Thank you, Emma. That was really great. Uh, you can type your questions in the Q&A or in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. While we're waiting, I had a question for you. Have you thought since you didn't see um, that historical fire regime had any influence on burn severity? Have you thought about whether that's just whether that extends beyond your specific site that you're working on um, or how applicable that is to other areas in the region? Yeah, I mean, the beauty of the North American Fire Scar Tree Network is that we could expand or do a similar study um, with, you know, the, the whole network and, or different subsets and different kind of ecosystems and, and regions. So I haven't thought a ton about that myself, but it's totally a great question. It'd be cool to, to dig into that more. Great, thanks. All right, looks like we have a question from Jen Stevens in the chat. Uh, he says, nice talk, Emma. Did you include species ID in any of your analyses or was your sampling restricted to Ponderosa? Um, no, and no, <laughs> not yet. I, I could split that out and look at different species, but we have sampled trees of, of all kinds of species, really. Um, predominantly ponderosa pine and dug fir, but there's a bunch of different pines in there, especially like in the sky islands and stuff. So that's another great idea for future research. Great. Any other questions? You'll also feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. We've got about two minutes left before we need to move on. And if we have no other questions, feel free to take a quick stretch break here um, and we'll get started with our next presentation um, in just a couple minutes. Thanks again, folks. All right, so next up we have Neil Gifford and he's coming to us from the Albany Pine Bush Preserve Commission. Neil, your slides look great and take it away. Great. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, excited to be here. Happy to be here from Albany, New York, where winter has in full swing already. And I'm coming to you from the Albany Pine Bush Preserve, which is the ancestral lands of both the Mohican and the Haudenosaunee um, First Nation peoples. Um, so with that, let, let, let's begin. Um, you know, attempting to restore ecosystem dynamics in endangered wildlife habitat in highly degraded fire dependent ecosystems by simply applying what we know a post-colonial disturbance regime can be logistically challenging and ecologically ineffective. In this presentation, we'll look at how 30 years of prescribed fire and monitoring here has refined our understanding of ecosystem dynamics and management needs in the world's best remaining example of an inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens. My co-authors in this presentation are our fire manager, Tyler Briggs, my conservation biologist, Steve Campbell, and my field ecologist and entomologist, Amanda Dillon. The Albany pine bush is located in the east central part of New York State. It is one of fewer than 20 pine barrens that exist today as an archipelago of rare fire dependent habitat islands in a virtual sea of closed canopy forest and human development. The fact that these barrens share many rare and relatively immobile plant and animal species suggests much greater connectivity between them in the past. But without a fully functional reference community, how do we know what we want to restore or how to get there? More of a thicket, really, much of the remnant barrens look like these pictures when the preserve was created in 1988. And yet it still supported remnant populations of some very rare species. Fire records here revealed abundant fire, 
in Albany with an average of two to 15 fires per year between 1929 and 1986. Most of those fires, of course, occurred in the spring dormant season. Based on this history, managers initially hoped fire would be a heal all for restoring ecosystem function and rare species habitat. However, there was limited information on the fire effects or the fire regime needed for maximum benefit to the many individual rare species of interest. So 1991, 30 years ago this spring, Described fire was initiated in the pine bush, primarily thanks to the Nature Conservancy and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And those initial fire and those initial fires were exclusively in the spring dormant season. But these fires could be logistically challenging, like this 1995 prescribed fire. This was my inaugural season here on, on crew. Um, as you can see, after decades of fire suppression, Dormant barrens can produce extremely high flame lengths and rapid rates of spread, lots of smoke, and lots of stress for fire managers. These burns also produce limited ecological benefits. While they maintain the scrub oak thickets, they did not significantly reduce litter and duff or expose mineral soil sufficient to trigger regeneration of important plants like pitch pine, native grasses, or wildflowers like wild blue lupin the sole food plant for the endangered corner blue butterfly. Ultimately, we realized that the system was so heavily out of balance that we could not rely on fire alone to safely and effectively achieve our ecological and fuel reduction objectives. This resulted in a major paradigm shift that relies heavily on mechanical and chemical pretreatments to eliminate invasive species, reduce overabundant native plants, and reduce and rearrange hazardous fuels. Much like our own health, the actions required to reset the system after serious decline are quite different from the actions needed to maintain a system that is healthy. And applying mechanical, chemical, and fire tools in the right sequence has resulted in logistically manageable fires. In particular, combined mechanical pretreatments with growing season fire resulted in reduced flame lengths and rates of spread, greater fire effectiveness with less intensity, better smoke management, and reduced risk overall. These techniques also allowed us to expand the burn window from three months to 11, increasing the opportunity to apply fire and the annual area burned illustrated here. They are also much more enjoyable experiences for the crew. And they've helped recreate a diverse fire managed landscape. Since 1991, we've applied prescribed fire to manage more than three, 1,357 hectares within a 573 hectare footprint. And here the colors illustrate the, the, the years of, of the most recent fires with black being 2021. But it's not enough to just make management units black. We need to know if we are achieving ecological objectives for the system and the rare wildlife it supports. Monitoring, in this case, comparing mowing to combined mow and growing season prescribed fire shows we are simultaneously improving structural diversity, the upper and lower left-hand graphic here, while maintaining plant species composition, which you can see in that lower right graphic. Of particular importance, these combination treatments eliminate litter and duff, exposing mineral soil. And that has facilitated a pretty dramatic expansion of wild blue lupin, the top picture, and significant pitch pine recruitment for the first time in our, in our history. To understand if this new paradigm is improving ecosystem dynamics, we monitor the distribution, abundance, productivity, and survival of rare and indicator wildlife. These species are really the best system-specific surrogates we have for evaluating ecosystem health. This includes the endangered corner blue, whose metapopulation size and structure now far exceeds all state and federal recovery minimums. Um, the minimum population size there illustrated with the red arrow of 3,000 butterflies. We have expanded lupin, the host host plant, from fewer than five hectares to over 285 hectares in the preserve. And note that the annual population estimates illustrated with the dashed line and the red and blue dots are extremely conservative since they only apply to the 13% of the occupied habitat we survey. The actual population of corner blue butterflies in the preserve is much higher than anything illustrated here. <clears throat> 
But one species success is a very limited window on ecosystem health. So we also look at a variety of other taxa. As a result, we know that the preserve supports many populations of fire dependent species, including more than 180 species of native bees and robust populations of pine barrens, butterflies, and moths, including two species previously considered extirpated, the wax sallow moth and Henry's elephant. And the preserve is, thought, is believed to support the largest known populations of both the frosted elephant and the model dusky wing skipper. Point count and bird banding data here also show improved distribution and abundance of Pine Barrens birds, including many that are declining like the Eastern Towhee and Prairie Warbler. Here we show the male density estimates for six of for the six best Pine Barrens indicator species from our point count data. But most noteworthy, the Eastern Whooperwill has returned to this landscape after 30 years of absence and began breeding here again in 2019. So at this point, there are about 500 hectares of the preserve where we've transitioned from restoration to maintenance. But we're still really trying to figure out just what that maintenance fire regime should be. But again, without a, without a reference community, how can we figure this out? For clues, we looked for pre-colonial evidence. We recently discovered that pollen and charcoal and wetland sediment here reveal a 6,600 year pine oak dominated landscape and a fire history just as long. Historical wildlife data also suggests a much more open canopied habitat condition. But if that's the case, how did these fires start? While lightning certainly played an important occasional role, we are coming to understand the essential role of First Nation peoples in creating and maintaining the pyrophilic system we're trying to restore. And more recently, we are learning that indigenous fire stewardship was widespread and strongly influenced plant and animal communities um, throughout North America, especially in the East. And for anyone familiar with Oswald et al., um, Abrams and Nowacki's recent, recent paper is a, is a really good read. But keep in mind too, the time scales. Indigenous people used fire for potentially thousands of years before, prior to European colonization. Disease, genocide, and subsequent economic development interrupted that indigenous fire stewardship, resulting in the more closed canopy forests and thickets that we inherited. So we're coming to appreciate that a maintenance fire regime of high frequency, low to moderate severity fire is likely the key to maintaining what we have restored. As we apply this, we are seeing some surprising results. For example, maintenance growing season fires burn around the densest patches of lupin, the wild, wild blue lupin, the wildflowers seen here, providing refugia for carners, a species that cannot survive fire at any life stage. These refugia would not exist in the dormant season. More surprisingly, lupin that did burn re-sprouts flowers and stays green until killing frost, while unburned plant plants die back in midsummer. Extending the potential time caterpillars can survive. Lab experiments also show that carner larvae fed lupin from plants that re that re-sprout immediately after fire produce more eggs. So maintenance growing season fire fires can produce a diverse mosaic of both lupin quality and quantity and improve metapopulation function. So with 30 years of management and monitoring, monitoring, we now realize that healthy inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens are not represented by the thickets we inherited. Rather, it is much more of an open canopy grassy shrubland in its best condition, a landscape that can simultaneously support large populations of the rarest wildlife and a fire regime that likely resembles the one maintained through indigenous fire for millennia. I want to thank our funders, of course, funding for research and management in the Albany Pine Bush Preserve is provided by the New York State Environmental Protection Fund with support from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the USDA Forest Service Wildfire Risk Reduction Grant, and the Northeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Regional Conservation Needs Grant. Thank you. With that, I'm happy to Answer any questions, Charlotte, if there's still time. Thank you, Neil. That was really great. We have, looks like nine minutes before we need to get started on our next talk. So we've got plenty of time for questions. That Feel never free. happens to me. So that's the benefit of having a script, I guess. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> um, feel free to put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A for Neil or unmute yourself.
Hey, and Neil, I have a quick question. Um, with your um, growing season burns, what kind of are your uh, temperature and your fuel moistures at when you're doing those? Well, 10 hour fuel moisture has to be within, you know, um, within prescription. So generally it's around um, 10 to 15. And the temperature ranges anywhere from, you know, in the early growing season, you're talking about the high 50s, low 60s, up to about 90 to 95 is our cutoff. And really that depends on how, how accustomed the crew is by the time those high temperatures um, come into play. But once sure. we get once we get conditioned, we can deal with with ninety degrees and slight slight humidity. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Hi, Neil. I had a similar question um, about um, with a maintenance growing season burn. Do you are you targeting a, a certain growing stage or moisture content for the lupin so that the fire doesn't burn through the lupin? Was I because I understand you right that you yeah. don't want the fire to burn through the lupins because that gives that kind of refugia for the but, well, butterfly. Well, that's a great question. So it's a yes and no. So the our, our federal and state permits don't allow us to burn more than a third of an occupied subpopulation. And technically we could burn like if you know if one management unit that we're burning is less than a third of that subpop, we could burn the whole thing. Um, and that was our original plan, not realizing that lupin wouldn't burn when it was that wet. Um, but we do, so we, we are trying to provide refugia, but not necessarily in each individual burning. What was the first part of your question? Oh, uh, I just, um, it was related to that. I didn't know if you were trying to, like, when you're trying to find your burn prescriptions, um, if it was more related to, like, the previous question asked about, um, uh, dead and dead fuel moistures, and I didn't know yes. if you're looking at live fuel moistures related to the lupin and kind of okay. uh, development stage so of the lupin. It, it depends on how much, it really depends on how much of the occupied habitat we're burning and what effect we want. We've, we've realized that we can really dial this in. So units that have a lot of lupin and a lot of butterflies, um, like the one illustrated here on that title slide, we do try and target those those growing season burns while lupin early in the season while lupin is in in full bloom, so that moisture of extinction gives us that nice diverse mosaic. But really, growing season burns have the pair have been a game changer for us by having mechanical pretreatments first and generating a really long um, high severity and long residence time, so that we end up cons not only consuming all of that woody woody mowing slag. What you can't see there is there's an awful lot of scrub oak that was mowed and invisible at this point because it was mowed and burned up. So we're trying to remove all that all that woody debris, but also generate a residence time that will burn through not only the litter but also much of the much of the um, duff and organic matter to expose mineral soil. The pine bush sits on a massive field of parabolic sand dunes, glacial outwash that was swept into sand dunes, and mo most of these species, much like what what is required in the southeast really need that exposed mineral soil in order to thrive. Great, Neil, I had a question for you kind of related. Um, so are you finding that the growing season burns are actually more useful in meeting your objectives? Yes, in the restoration phase. Again, where we're really trying to change the structural component of the system from a scrub oak thicket to a more grassy, grassy shrubland. And then again, in eliminating litter and duff so we can actually get pitch pine recruitment, um, New Jersey tea sprouting and seed, seeds germinating, get loop, you know, ha have lupin expanding. Um, it's really been a game changer for us. So in the maintenance phase, it's almost ideally, I'd love to flip a coin, but we're in Albany. So the, the logistics of burning in this wildland urban interface are ridiculous. Um, so. Now, as you saw from that earlier graph, you know, it's roughly 50-50 where half of our burns are in the dormant season, half of them are in the growing season. Um, the maintenance burns, we are targeting the dormant season a lot, but when the restoration phase, we're really trying to get rid of decades of organic matter and litter and duff. Yeah, these growing season mechanical and fire treatments are unlike anything we've tried in the past. And the, the fact that the fires end up being logistically so much easier and less stressful from a management perspective was, was just a huge benefit. 
we had concerns about steam and smoke and all of that in this landscape and it actually dramatically opened our burn window where we can burn now in light and variable winds because when the fire runs out of the mowing slash moisture of extinction puts it out so we don't need to worry about you know those light and variable winds in the growing season in the dormant season where it's like burning in, a, in the prairie where the fire can wrap make big runs on you very quickly in the growing season the wind switches for a minute and it's really not a big deal because there's so much heat generating pushing that smoke up and away from all the smoke sensitive areas and the rates of spread just are not you can almost outwalk many of these fires right yeah that makes a lot of sense it's it's very impressive um coming from out west that what you're able to pull off <laughs> in such a um in the wildland and urban interface like you like you showed in that map um it looks like we have another question okay um any warming effects observed or projected for the Carner? This... Yes, so I, I sit on the, on the federal recovery team for the Carner and there's a sub team looking at, at climate change and it, it does, the early results suggest that the, the climate window for Carners is, go, is gonna move significantly north in, in you know, 50 to 80, 100 years. Um, so one of, the, one of the things we're trying to be conscious about with our management um, the pine bush isn't flat. It's one of, the, one of the things that sets it apart from all other pine barrens. It's, it's on this rolling massive field of sand dunes. So we're taking advantage of topography and north facing slopes to, to try and create some climate refugia for them in the short term. And we're trying to build the population as large as possible so that hopefully some, someday in 20, 30 years from now, we might be a source population for accelerated colonization um, and accelerated migration, assisted migration to sites farther north. Good question. Great. Any other lingering questions? We have about a minute left. Sure. And, and Neil, this is. Uh, I just had one more. I just had one more question. Um, when you do the mowing, it's like when when you mow it, and then how long do you wait before you burn it? Like, what well, we typically mow it in the winter, mostly to avoid impacts to wildlife. Um. And then we were burning it, you know, that the, the picture on that title slide was a May burn, but it's 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 burn it's being burned any whenever we get the conditions to burn, but any any time after snow melt. So anywhere from a couple of months to maybe six or seven months later, we'll still we'll cool. still burn 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 in the growing season. Thank you. Yep, thank you. So next up we have Corey Blankenship, who's coming to us from the Nature Conservancy. Corey, you can go ahead and share your screen. All right, great. Thanks so much, everyone, for taking the time to be here. Um, I'm going to jump up into a much broader scale now than Neil was talking about. Um, this is work done by the Nature Conservancy's land fire team, of which I am a member, as and you can see the other members of that team here. And today I want to talk about updating the U.S. fire regime data, specifically the land fire data sets, and what kind of insight that provides us into the state of fire ecology knowledge at a national scale. I'll begin by giving a little bit of background about the land fire historical fire regime data and how we produce those data. And then I'm going to jump into a fairly simple analysis I did to answer this question of where and why has the land fire fire regime information changed over time. And then I'll go into just a little bit of a case study to explore well, why does that matter. And then we'll wrap up with some take home messages. Land fire fire regime attributes are generated from a set of ecological models. We call these biophysical settings models. They're also known as state and transition simulation models. Each model represents one ecosystem. In land fire speak, we call this a biophysical setting. And here you're seeing an example of a sagebrush biophysical setting or BPS model. The model represents one ecosystem, and then we um, break that down into discrete states. So here you see three different states for a sagebrush biophysical setting. Then we define the rates of growth and the pathways for growth between those states. And we define 
the probabilities and the pathways for different disturbances. So for example, in the sagebrush ecosystem, you might have drought and you might have fire. And here I'm just showing the annual probability associated with the fire disturbances in these models. So they are uh, quantitative models. We use these models to estimate a set of pre-colonization reference conditions for every ecosystem. And we can use that as a baseline then from which to measure change on the landscape today. All the models are built by experts based on um, literature as well as their knowledge and judgment. We run these models out over time to estimate the reference amount of each state um, that you might expect on the landscape. So here you're seeing the different reference proportions for the three states in this example sagebrush model. We also estimate the reference fire frequency and severity for each ecosystem. And then with those estimates of fire frequency and severity, we can tie that to our map of biophysical settings. And that allows us to map fire frequency, severity, and fire regimes at a national scale. So here's our map for the conterminous US showing both frequency and severity. And we also have these data for Alaska and Hawaii. We have been developing these models and estimating fire regimes with them since the early 2000s. We are building on the work of the Interior Columbia River Basin Project, as well as the fire regime condition class effort. Um, most recently, we updated the land fire biophysical settings model set and re-released it in the last year. So you can see here on this timeline, we've been at this effort for quite some time. And I was interested in this broad broad question of, well, what have we learned over this span of time through this endeavor? What have we learned about fire ecology and where is our knowledge base advancing? So to get at that question, I compared the two most recent versions of our fire regime estimates. So um, what's labeled on um, this, the graphic here as national implementation, I'm going to refer to that going forward is our version 1.0 set of um, fire regime estimates. And that came out in about 2009. And I'm comparing that to our more recent version, which I'm calling version 2.0. And we just published that in 2020. So looking at these two versions, trying to understand where our understanding of fire ecology has changed. So specifically, I tried to answer this question, where did fire regime parameters change as a result of our review and why? So you can see in this little table, I did a fairly simple analysis where I took the different fire regime parameters shown in that left column, which is basically the fire frequency or mean fire return interval for each fire severity type, as well as at the bottom of the table, you see the overall mean fire return interval. And I compared that for version 1.0 and version 2.0. And then I tried to classify what type of change, why that change occurred. If, if a return interval did change, was that change based on old research? And that would have been research that was available at the time of the version 1.0 model development. Or was it based on new research that came out since the version 1.0 models were developed? And then I also looked at, was it based on expert judgment or was it undocumented? And I lumped those two things together because I think oftentimes if it was undocumented, it probably was based on expert judgment or it may have been. A couple things to note here. One is that I only analyzed the data for the conterminous US and Hawaii. We're still working on the version 2.0 models for Alaska. So that data for Alaska are not included here. Also, um, I excluded what I thought were unintentional changes. So um, you could have stochastic variation in the model or a change to non-fire model parameters that would impact the fire return interval. But what I was really looking for were, or looking for were um, intentional changes where we updated the fire regime based either on new information um, or existing information or expert judgment. So here's what I found. 
I was able to analyze uh, 816 models that I could compare between version 1.0 and 2.0. That's nearly the complete model set for the conterminous US and Hawaii, but um, a few models were added and some subtracted, so it's not qu quite exactly the full set. Of those, uh, 170 received review in our most updated version of the models. And of that 170, 27 had a change in the fire regime based on the review. On the right here, you're seeing a graph that shows the reasons for fire regime change in the updated 2.0 model set. Most of the models changed based on new research that came out since the version 1.0 models were published. Some were based, some updates were based on old research where um, existing information at the time of the version 1.0 models did not appear to be used. And then we had you know, nine or 10 models where either expert judgment or um, uh, it was undocumented why the fire regime changed. So here's a look at the systems where we uh, had a change in fire regime, either based on expert judgment or it was undocumented. And um, because a lot of these are undocumented, it's a little bit hard to draw conclusions, but I wanna make a couple of observations that I think are um, interesting about this. One is that you see um, some of the sagebrush systems showing up in the West. And if you go to the fire effects information system, they have a great fire regime synthesis on sagebrush, and it shows really widely varying estimates of fire return interval. So that uncertainty in the literature is um, reflected in the models. And so there's just a high degree of uncertainty, be, uncertainty about fire regimes in sagebrush um, systems. The other thing that I think is really interesting here is that you're kind of seeing a, a spectrum of, um, of ecosystems, some on the drier end of the spectrum, and um, like the, say, mesquite upland scrub, and some on the wetter end of the spectrum, like the Appalachian shrub swamps. And so what tends to happen is that when you're really uh, dry or really wet, you don't burn as often, either maybe because you're fuel limited or the fuels are too moist. And um, also the, the species tend to be more fire sensitive. And so in general, in these, in these drier or wetter systems, we don't have as much fire history information um, as we would like. Okay, so now let's take a look at fire regimes where our information changed based on new research. So just to get oriented for a second to this map, what you're seeing are those systems that had a change based on new research. Um, they're labeled with their name and then below the name is um, a number indicating the direction of the mean fire return interval change. So for example, if you look at this pinion juniper type in the Great Basin, it has a plus 274, which means that the mean fire return interval increased by 270 years, excuse me, 274 years um, from version 1.0 to 2.0. In other words, we're now estimating that fire burned less frequently in this ecosystem. So what you can see is that um, although it's not that many ecosystems where the fire return interval changed, they are covering a fairly large area. And there's also some real geographic disparities. Um, the new research that we picked up um, here is predominantly in the Western US. Um, and then there are areas just um, where we did not pick up new research and maybe new research doesn't exist there or um, uh, maybe it just didn't come through in our review. The other thing you see is that most of the new research that we picked up tends to be in forested systems. And this holds true for all of the land fire biophysical settings models. We have more information about forests than we do about the grasslands and the shrublands. Also, you can see some really large changes. For example, the northern hardwoods had uh, a decrease or, or shows more frequent fire, uh, much more frequent fire in version 2.0 than version 1.0. And then there are other systems, for example, Ponderosa Pine out here in the Northwest, where it's a really uh, minor change and it's just a, a fine tuning or a calibration based on some new studies that have come online since version 1.0 was developed. <laughs> 
Um, another thing to note here is that sometimes the change isn't in the mean fire return interval. Sometimes the change is in the fire severity. A good example of that is this lodgepole system shown in bright green here in central Oregon. Um, the shift there was from in version 1.0, a high severity fire dominated fire regime to a mixed severity regime. And that was based on new information and um, a publication by Emily Heyerdahl and others that showed a more mixed severity fire regime for Lodgepole in Central Oregon. Okay, so now I want to dig a little bit deeper into why this, these changes occurred and why they matter. And I'm just going to look at one ecosystem. I'd love to go further, but um, we just don't have the time today. So I'm going to use this oak pine as an example to illustrate um, why it changed and um, why that matters. So here you're seeing a table displaying the fire return interval estimates for the Appalachian dry oak pine forest in version 1.0 versus version 2.0. So in our initial um, model for this type, we modeled a mean fire return interval overall of 99 years. And in version 2.0, we estimated a mean fire return interval of 14 years. Now this change um, was a result of a lot of new fire uh, history information that's come out relatively recently. This particular model for version 1.0 was developed in 2007. And as you can see in this map of fire history in the Appalachian regions from Lafon et al 2017, almost all the fire history studies in this region were published um, at 2007 or later. So for version 2.0, we had all this great fire history information that we could incorporate. And that explains the change that we see in the fire return interval for this particular biophysical setting. One limitation is that while we do have this great information, most of these fire history studies are based on fire scars in pines. We don't have as much data coming from the oaks. And this raises the question, is it appropriate to apply these fire return intervals to the broader oak matrix. So while we've got good data, there's still some outstanding questions. Now, I wanted to get at this question of, well, why does that matter? Why should we care about fire return intervals changing? And to do that, what I'm showing here is how the proportion of the states for the dry oak pine forest changes with a different fire return interval. So on the left, you see our version 1.0 estimate of the proportion of states. This is assuming the 99 year fire return interval. And what you see is that the oak pine forest is dominated by late, a late closed state. Under the 2.0 estimate of the um, reference conditions with a fire return interval of 14 years, you see that the landscape shifts to being dominated by late open forests. Um, and this really, so it just shifts our understanding dramatically of what this landscape may have looked like. Now, I've also put on here on the right column, the current amount of the landscape in each state. This is based on the land fire 2016 succession class layer. And currently we see a landscape dominated by mid cereal forest. So um, having a different understanding of the fire return interval dramatically changes our estimate of the reference conditions and really shifts what management actions we might consider if we wanted to restore this forest or if we were looking um, to move forward just our understanding of, of how this forest developed and what it may have looked like historically. All right, so um, to wrap up here, I'll go back to the sort of bigger question I asked to begin with, which is we've been at this effort of modeling and mapping fire regimes for the entire nation for over 15 years now. And what have we learned? Well, um, we did find dramatic changes in a few biophysical settings, um, but many did not change. So maybe we've picked up all the new fire history information, but I think um, a big outstanding question is, is there new information that we did not pick up in our review? I think it's uh, pretty safe to say, especially given the scale that we're working at, that we have probably missed some fire history information. 
one lesson learned um, as I look back um, through those systems that did change is that systematic reviews like that Lafon et al. 2017 paper or the information coming out of the fire effects information system, their fire regime synthesis and their lit reviews for specific species, those types of systematic reviews are extremely helpful for our modeling work and really helps us to incorporate all of the best information that's available. Um, you can't, um, well, sorry, I rearranged my slides here at the last minute, so I, <laughs> we'll skip to this next point. Um, where we did find change, it dramatically affected our understanding of um, ecosystems. And so, you know, where we, where you change the fire return interval, you can change what you think the landscape may have looked like prior to colonization. It can also change what we think of as sustainable conditions or conditions that might be resilient in a future climate. And then it shifts what types of management actions we might think are appropriate. Um, so um, understanding these kinds of changes, I do think is important for management. Also, um, I've done this work now for about 15 years and a big take home message is that we have many gaps in our knowledge. So while we do capture the broad scale patterns well, um, there, when you zoom in, there are a lot of systems that we just don't have information for, particularly in our grassland and shrubland systems, the non-forests or forests that don't that have trees that don't record fire scars. And then even in well-studied systems like the oak pine, um, we can still have uncertainty. It's hard to know how far we can extrapolate from existing studies. When you're trying to model fire regimes and um, estimate historical fire regimes at a national scale, you quickly run into this problem of how far can we take the existing information. So while our information is limited, um, I do still think this is a really important endeavor because it helps us to understand the kinds of conditions um, to which uh, our ecosystems today are adapted. If you're interested in the biophysical settings models and landfires historical fire regime data, you can learn more about that in this paper that our team recently published in the journal Ecosphere. And I've got a QR code linked to it there, or you can search it by the title. Um, it is uh, available for free. It's not behind the pay paywall. And of course, you can contact me. Um, I hope I have time for questions. Uh, thanks again for joining, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you so much, Corey. That was really great. Next up, we have last but not least, uh, Jennifer Phil. And Jennifer is a postdoc at the University of Florida. So Jennifer, it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, my name is Jen. I'm a postdoc in Dr. Ray Crandall's Fire Ecology Lab at UF. Um, and I'm really delighted to tell you uh, the story about the beginning of what we hope will be a long-term collaboration um, between myself and Dr. Crandall and managers, uh, fire managers and community members in Belize. Um, in particular, we thank Fanny Tricone Mar um, and Rick Anderson who, um, operate Dos Fuegos Fire Management in Belize and in Florida, and Mario Moosechamp, who um, performs fire management at uh, the Toledo Institute of uh, Development and Environment in Belize, um, for raising some very interesting questions about fire management um, and its relationship with Caribbean pine um, in Belize. So um, they kind of started the story that I'll tell you. Next slide. So this story takes place in Belize and this red box um, highlights the area where um, the questions kind of originated. Um, there are three main protected areas, Deep River, the picture on the right shows Deep River, Swazi Bladen and Payne's Creek National Park. Um, and there are also a number of Southern uh, Belize villages um, who have interest in the fire management of the area. They're primarily Maya, Creole, and Mestizo communities. Um, so Dos Fuegos and uh, 
the Toledo Institute for Development and Environment, um, who manages Paynes Creek National Park, cooperated with these local communities to address some fire management issues. So what were these issues? Well, next slide. There is a lot of fire in Belize. So there's, um, especially in Southern Belize, there's very large tracts of Caribbean pine savannas, um, which have been experiencing very frequent fire for a long time. Um, it's this frequent fire was noted as early as the 1920s by um, uh, foresters in the former British colony. And those frequent fires continue today. Um, there's very little fire suppression that goes on um, for a number of reasons, most notably capacity. Um, next slide. And while fire, we know that in many systems, especially savannas, fire is an important part and is not necessarily always destructive. Um, the question arose as to you know, how much fire is really appropriate in these savannas. There's a lack of historical fire regime information. And the fact that um, fires were occurring, have been occurring every year, in some cases, multiple times a year. Um, managers and community members were wondering, for instance, whether pine seedlings could even sustain such a frequent fire regime. Were they going to use, to lose this resource? Um, under such frequent regimes. Next slide. So local, local community members um, work with protected area managers to learn safe burning practices um, on their farms and their croplands, and um, as well as how to use safe ignition techniques to protect their homes. So there's a real interest in fire management locally. Next slide. And because everyone is very invested in this fire management question, um, they had some very specific questions that they came together and, and talked about. And they is specifically, there were a few resources that they were concerned about. First of all, pine regeneration, because it's very important for timber. Um, and it's also Caribbean pine savannas are very important habitat for the endangered yellow-headed parrot, which uses the trees um, for nesting, mature trees for nesting. If you don't have pine seedlings, you're not going to have adult trees. Um, they also harvest palmetto berries um, from the palmettos that are very abundant um, in the savannas. And so they were wondering what are these, how are these frequent fires affecting our, our resources? So in 2017, um, Dos Fuegos and Tide received funding from the Darwin, the UK's Darwin Initiative to start up a monitoring program to monitor these resources under these fire regimes. So next slide. So what they, what they did was they put out 14 plots across the landscape at Paynes Creek National Park. And these were um, 10 by 20 plots that um, were located in areas where there were pine seedlings and palmettos. And I'm going to talk specifically, focus on pine seedlings specifically in this talk. Um, and their question was, how does fire affect these young Caribbean pines in these three different um, types of savanna throughout the park? Very open areas, shrubby areas, and densely wooded areas. So they put plots out in these, in these locations and they individually tagged seedlings and adult trees that were within the plots. And in 2017, they measured how big they were. And then in 2018, 2019, and 2020, they came back and they recorded size once again, survival, and they tagged any new pine seedlings. Um, next slide. So this is where we came in. Um, I spoke with Rick, uh, Rick reached out to me, the um, Tide reached out to me, and we had a conversation about, oh, how can we as researchers use our skills to analyze these data? Um, and so they shared their data with us, and we took a first look at um, what was going on with these pine seedlings. 
And we found that, um, I should mention that whenever they went back to these plots, they recorded whether a fire had burned through the plot in the last year, and they checked the char height on the trees in the plot to see how intense as a, as a, a proxy for fire intensity. So when we looked at the intensity measurements, um, it appeared that fires in the open savanna and the shrubby savanna were relatively moderate, um, but the fires were much patchier in the shrubby savannas. Whereas in densely wooded areas, the fire intensity was high and fuels were pretty much were consumed um, fairly completely. Um, so what happened with the pine seedlings? <laughs> well, um, the interesting result was that in shrubby areas, um, it didn't matter whether seedlings had experienced a fire or not. Their survival from one year to the next was pretty the, about similar proportions of seedlings survived. Whereas in the open savannas and the densely wooded savannas, um, with, in years with fire, seedlings really took a hit. So next slide. I wanna focus on this result um, that comparing the open and shrubby savanna, cause these were the most common they were the most, it was the most common landscape variation that you see. There weren't a whole lot of densely wooded areas around. Um, you can note that even though survival wasn't hugely different in the shrubby areas, it's still pretty low. Um, you know, fewer than half the seedlings survived whether there was fire or not. Um, so we were wondering, I mean, how abnormal is this? Is this bad? You know, should we be worried? <laughs> um, and so we said, okay, well, we have more data. Let's take a step back and see what's happening with the populations overall. So let's use our, our adult, our data on the adults, their survival, their growth. Let's use the seedling growth data and, and model how the populations are doing in years with fire and without fire in these environments. So next slide. So what we did was we grouped the populations, the uh, trees that were measured and monitored into four groups. Um, on the left, under the population growth rate heading, you can see we have them grouped as to whether they occurred in savanna or shrub environments a shrubby savanna environments. And short means that these, the, the tree data was taken in a year um, where the trees had experienced fire very recently, say within less than a year. And the long included the data taken on trees um, that trees um, that had experienced fire, say maybe two, more than a year to two years prior. So they had a little bit of breathing space. So we developed um, integral projection models, which are, they model, they're demographic models. So they model uh, population demography. And I'm happy to go into the details of that if you want, but I'm not gonna go into that in this talk. Um, what we do basically is put in information on survival and reproduction and growth, and we model that over time. Um, and we see whether the populations appear to be growing, maintaining, or declining. So we ran, I'm going to call them IPMs, um, great acronyms. We all love them. So uh, we ran these IPMs. We ran four, one for each of these groups. And under population growth rate, you can see that these numbers are less than one. If it was one, the populations would be maintaining. If it was over one, they're they're growing, and if it's less than one, they're declining. So it appears that in all of these environments, um, the Caribbean pine populations seem to be declining, not rapidly, but you know they're not growing. And so when we dug into the data, um, it seems that this these dynamics are resulting from a combination of survival and growth rates, especially at smaller sizes. Um, so you can see for in this graph, we have size on the x-axis and survival on the y-axis. And the, for the, the um, purple and the green 
lines are for the very short interval fires. And so under short fire return intervals, those seedlings, a lot of the small ones were dying, but the larger ones had fairly reasonably, reasonably high survival. But for the um, groups that were had longer, slightly longer return intervals, there was higher survival of the young ones, um, but a few of the larger ones um, fell off the grid. They took a hit. <laughs> So they didn't, they, we had some deaths in the, the slightly larger size classes. Um, so next slide. So we saw that pattern with survival and we were wondering, does that, how much does that matter? You know, if we could make these seedlings survive so much more, you know, if they had much higher survival, would it help the population? And so we put in, we, we, we looked at how sensitive these population models were um, to a 5% increase in um, reproduction, survival, and growth. Reproduction didn't matter, so I didn't not show you on, on this graph, but you can see on the y-axis, the change in population growth rate was only slightly affected with a 5% increase in survival. You see these uh, little bars here on the on the left, um, but on the right where you see growth, a five percent increase in growth actually bumped the population growth rate up to one. I mean, just a slight change in growth um, made a big difference in the models. So it appeared that the models were very were much more sensitive to growth rate, but they were also sensitive to survival. So next slide. This graph is, is pretty and it's like, well, what does it mean? It's not a UFO. <laughs> so on the, on the X axis, we have a size, we have the size at time one, that initial size. And this blob, this blob is hanging over the 10 to 20 centimeter DBH region. Now, if you're a pine seedling and you're in the 10 to 20 centimeter DBH region, DBH region it, because you're going to make the biggest contribution to the population growth rate. Um, and so what that is showing here is just that those sort of like not teeny tiny, but, but larger, larger seedlings are really important and they need to survive and they need to grow. So next slide. The story isn't over. <laughs> Those are preliminary results. I wish I could say we answered the question and we gave them, you know, they, we told them what we knew. Um, so, but again, this is ongoing and it's very, very exciting. But I tell you this story because it's really cool. It's a really cool demonstration of how our collaboration helped um, address the needs in these communities. They established the monitoring, they identified a problem, they established the initial monitoring, and then they reached out to us for our scientific skills to analyze the data and give them some feedback um, that they could use to inform um, their operations. And so we're hoping for this kind of adaptive framework to continue. It's very, very exciting. I have very many people to thank, um, the rangers and staff, university students, um, yeah, just everyone who was involved, our funding sources, and I hope to have more updates um, in the coming months and years. So thank you so much for listening, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. There we go. <laughs> Computer's going a little slow here. Thanks so much, Jen. That was really great. Um, and sounds like some really interesting work and collaborations. Uh, folks feel, I know we're getting close to the end of the day here. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A or unmute yourself. I had one question for you. Um, do the folks that are you know, on the ground in these systems is there anything that they have tried or do they have any ideas of how to increase survival? Yeah, so when we came on the scene, they had they had just kind of 
hit at that preliminary, I think there's greater survival in shrubs. So they had started to sort of tweak their, their ignition um, locations and their burning techniques to make sure that the, to kind of back off with the intensity in those areas. Um, you know, if it was, if it seemed like, I mean, they weren't going to send a rushing head fire at the shrubby areas. So they, they had begun to think about tweaking it because um, they were noticing those patterns. Um, one result that I, that I didn't go into, I didn't mention was that we tried burning some areas in different seasons. So we, we burned in the dry season and we burned in the wet season. Um, and there seems to be some interactions going on. We can't say for sure that burning in one season, you know, would be dramatically better for their survival. Um, but it's it's something that we want to pursue further. So they are very open to trying things. It's really cool. That's great. Uh, it sounds like we have a question in the chat, and for some reason, I am not seeing it. Um, no worry, Charlotte. I can I can read it. <laughs> Thank you. It is from Michael Stombog. A really interesting talk. My historical fire research in the southeastern U.S. detects multiple fires in a single year in several locations. What is the most number of fires in a single year that you are aware of, and what are the reasons for burning multiple times in a single year? Yeah, great question. Um, as since we've been involved with the project, um, some of the I've I've only seen, I've seen two, so biannual, two in, in certain areas. It's really amazing that, yeah, that the fuels can recover fast enough to sustain that. So I've seen, I've seen areas that have burned twice in a year. Um, I don't know if they can sustain like three, um, but it's, it's a lot of escaped fires. So there's not, um, there's not a whole lot of, of, active, you know, very micro management of fire. Lots of people burn um, for farming, they burn for hunting, and these fires just get out and they go. So um, that's, that's where a lot of the fires are coming from. And, and it's a lot of where the fires came from historically, at least from the information that we have. There's not really, I know that people have done there are people looking at tree ring data. I haven't seen those data. I haven't seen those results. Um, so I can't say for sure either where that, you know, in terms of um, dendrochronology, how that's contributing to knowing, you know, even how frequently these could have burned um, historically. So great question. Thank you. 